At this time, let me introduce uh, Gunjan. Gunjan is a proud Pan IITian. He was the president and chairman of uh, Pan IIT USA. He's a graduate of IIT Kanpur, and presently he is CEO of Emirate Corporation. So Gunjan, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, really appreciate this. And uh, it, this is going to be a fun discussion, uh, uh, looking at the work coming out of the Jet Propulsion Labs, which is a NASA lab. And we have two fascinating speakers. Uh, I did want to alert the audience that the uh, polls are active. So if you are online, uh, please go take a look at the polls and answer the questions that uh, we have put up there. We'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, I think there's four questions. And uh, we are in Hollywood here in Southern California. So at least one of the questions has to be about a movie. And I will ask both of our speakers that question as well. Uh, so uh, please take a few moments to, uh, to look at that. Now, many of you might have attended the keynote speech by Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday. And he had only 15 minutes to talk, but I am so glad that he put in a plug for our session because he mentioned space technology and space startups in India. And then he quoted from one of our favorite uh, shows uh, talking about going boldly where no one has gone before, uh, which you will hear plenty about in this session. Um, you might also know some of you in the audience that uh, the topic we are going to talk about now is not the first time these things are happening. When, when ISRO launched the Chandrayaan mission a few years ago, aboard that, that moon mission were two American experiments and JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs had something to do with at least one of them. And that led to the discovery of uh, water on the moon. So uh, the collaboration between India and the United States has been going on for a while, but we are going to talk about two very new and very interesting things. One which has an IIT angle and one which has an ISRO angle. Uh, let me start with the ISRO angle. And about three years ago, I was speaking at an event called Select Los Angeles, uh, organized by the mayor of Los Angeles. And one of the other speakers at that session was General Larry James, who I think had just returned or was just getting ready to go to India to discuss the very thing we are going to talk about today. So we struck up a short conversation. And then I remembered that when we had this uh, pan IIT discussion and General James has been kind enough to give us some of his time today. Uh, Larry James uh, is an aerospace engineer and uh, then went on to get his master's degree at MIT. Uh, he was with the US Air Force for a number of years. And at the time of his retirement, he had 20,000 uh, people uh, at the Air Force working under his organization, having to do with, uh, uh, with ISR. And uh, let me see if I can recall exactly what ISR stands for. Uh, Larry, can you help me out? Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, I forgot about intelligence. You know, I left my intelligence at IIT. <laughs> so uh, it's great that you have an MIT connection because I'm a graduate of IIT Kanpur and IIT Kanpur was set up by MIT and Caltech. And Caltech, of course, runs NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs. So we have a good connection there. Um, I'm going to turn, uh, let, let's see if uh, the polls have uh, produced any results yet. Can, can, can you share the poll results if they're coming in? I guess our tech team is still working on that so we can start with the slides. So, so Larry, what I'd like to do is have you run through the slides fairly quickly and then we can get into our Q&A session right away. So uh, let me bring those up. All right, Gunjan, well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, it's certainly a, a privilege to me, for me to uh, speak to this uh, large group that is focused on IIT in India and uh, really all that's going on in India with science and technology, and in particular for me, space. Uh, just a, a little bit of background. Um, I've been to India multiple times now. Um, 
in support of uh, the NISAR program, everywhere from Bangalore to Aminabad to uh, Trivandrum to Delhi to Chennai, uh, et cetera, uh, just uh, really in support of our growing relationship and in support of uh, this particular project, which is an absolutely essential project for both, I think, NASA and Israel. So if we just go to the next slide. I'll just give you a little bit of background on NISAR. Many of you know about that particular mission, but I wanted to highlight some of the key things and key areas because it really is a very strong partnership, uh, you know, a, an equal partnership. And Gunjan, if you could flip to the next slide, uh, mine's not moving. I don't know. There we go. So just kind of highlighting uh, how we put the work together. First of all, this is a synthetic aperture radar. It's a swept synthetic aperture radar. So the beam uh, digitally sweeps across the surface of the earth. It operates in two bands, L band and S band. L band, as you can see there in the green provided by JPL and S band in the red provided by ISRO. Uh, ISRO is providing the bus, the satellite bus that we will put all of these payloads onto. And then uh, the radar instrument suite uh, which is a, a key component that JPL is putting together. So the S-band electronics will come to JPL, will install the instrument suite and put it all together there to create the payload. Uh, we're also providing the, uh, the large deployed radar antenna, as you can see, 12 meters. So I think this is the largest swept SAR uh, antenna that we've ever put up in space. And of course, the boom itself to, to uh, deploy the, the antenna. So that's kind of the, a picture of the work share. And of course, as you see on the left, uh, ISRO is providing uh, the launch vehicle of going from your, uh, your launch site there in the Southeast India on the GSLV Mark II. Uh, so we're very excited about that as well. To be honest, I haven't been to the launch site yet. So I hope to be able to get to go there uh, when we launch in early uh, 2023. So that's just a little bit of background. Uh, the intent is to really examine the earth from a polar orbit. And uh, we kind of have the tagline, uh, you know, studying the earth in motion. And certainly Gunjan, we can get into more details on that as we get into the questions. But you can see the ISRO centers that are involved uh, really split across uh, almost every key center for ISRO. Next slide. And again, I just wanted to highlight some pictures here, just showing you the cooperation. You can see on the right side, uh, the uh, S-band SAR radar electronics and system tests at Aminabad. Uh, so uh, a very important milestone for the program. Uh, that payload should be delivered to JPL here very soon. And then on the left is the L-band SAR system being constructed at JPL and going into the vacuum chamber. We've completed our environmental testing on that component. So everything is moving along very well. And we're about to reach the point where we get all the components together and start integrating the payload. Uh, next slide. And this is just uh, really to point out that this is an incredible team. Uh, obviously, this is JPL and really NASA's first major uh, partnership with India on a major spacecraft program. So, of course, there's a lot of learning that goes along, plus <laughs> just figuring out how do you operate when you're essentially 12 and a half hours uh, separated from each other. When do you have your meetings? Uh, it's long flight time to go to India. So just working out all of those details. Uh, it has been a learning experience, I think, for both teams, but I would say now we are a well-oiled machine in terms of integrating, working together, and uh, really bringing this whole spacecraft together to support uh, the needs of both uh, the United States and the world and India. So uh, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to end on in terms of just pointing out that um, it is a great team. We've been working together, and uh, it's coming together well with the payload coming together here early next. So with that, we can go into kind of the Q&A there, Gunjan, and uh, go from there. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, for, for that great overview. And I do want to mention to the audience again, please keep sending us your questions. I haven't seen them on my side yet. Uh, so we, this will be as interactive as the audience wants to make it. Uh, and uh, uh, also for the tech team, let us know when you can show the polls. Uh, Let's get going with our Q&A, uh, General James. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the budget of this uh, program of NISAR or NISAR. Yeah, um, on the NASA side, uh, it's about $900 million. Um, 
And on the ISRO side, I don't have all the exact numbers, but I would say uh, in terms of the spacecraft, probably about 300 million in US dollar equivalents. And one point I would certainly make is that you know, this is a mission that has been a high priority for the United States. And if you're familiar with how we do science, we have decadal surveys that define what are the priorities of the missions. And this has been a very pri high priority for many, many years. And frankly, NASA could never uh, receive the funding to put this project together. So the ability for both of our nations to come together, uh, fund their portion of the program, is really what allowed us to get this project going and get it launched. And it really goes back to 2011, Alok Chatterjee, who is a, a graduate of IIT, currently works at JPL, originally started at the Satish Dewan Center there, uh, but has really been at JPL over 30 years. He has really kind of been working this since 2011 to bring this team together, get all the agreements in place and so on. So. Uh, shout out to him as well for the great work he's done. And he continues to be the primary interface for the NISAR project with this road. Right, right. I know Alok well, and he's a graduate of IIT Kharagpur. And, you know, he's spoken passionately about uh, the programs that he's been involved with, uh, having worked both at ISRO and JPL. Yes. I think yeah. uh, that's, that's a wonderful uh, person to have on your team. Absolutely. Uh, so one thing I just want to make clear to the audience is that this is, not simply a matter of JPL outsourcing some work to, to ISRO. This is really a collaboration of equals where both parties are have certain responsibilities to make this happen. Uh, and, you know, uh, as an IIT, and I'm very proud of the work that IITians have done, but I do want to recognize that most of the engineers working today at ISRO are not graduates of the IITs. And a shout out to all of them as well uh, in contributing to India's leadership in the space program. And I'm hoping we can see our poll results. I want to, I'm really curious to see how many people have joined in who are not IIT alumni. Uh, we, you know, as IIT alumni, we put together the program, but it's really open to all, uh, both in the US and in India. Um, now, uh, I want to explain to the audience a little bit about what this satellite is going to do. I understand it's the most expensive Earth observation satellite ever to be planned and probably the most sophisticated. So it has so many different goals. Uh, General James, I tried to you know, study that and I was reminded of my years as a student, but I think it'll take weeks to really understand everything. So I'd just like to check check off a few items to clarify. So many of the satellites that you know, people benefit from every day uh, are geosynchronous satellites launched you know, 23,000 uh, miles above the earth and they stay over the equator at a stationary point. This one is almost the exact opposite, right? You are almost in a polar orbit. So just right. tell us a little bit about what polar orbit and um, sun synchronous orbit, what, what does that mean? Yeah. So um, if you wanna be getting a view of the entire globe, and I think if, you, if you've been in the space business, you understand this, uh, you wanna be going over the poles because you're in an inertially stable orbit, but the earth is rotating beneath you. So uh, as the earth rotates, you get a different view of the earth every time you go around about every 90 to 100 minutes. So that's the reason for the low earth orbiters, we go into a polar orbit from a weather or earth science perspective. You wanna look at the entire globe. So we, as you said, we're about 750 kilometers up. Uh, obviously, the closer you are to the Earth, the better resolution you would get with radars or cameras or whatever. So you want to be reasonably close to get the best resolution. Uh, and then we're in that 98 degree orbit, which again, essentially gets us entire Earth coverage. And the way it's designed, we cover the entire Earth every 12 days. So every 12 days, we're mapping the Earth with our L-band and S-band radar. Uh, we get a great picture of that. And then what we do is we fly over the same location uh, and essentially uh, use radar interferometry to see what has changed uh, from the time we last flew over to the time that we are currently flying over. And when you're using interferometry, that allows you to get very, very precise measurements of what has changed. Has the earth moved? Has the foliage changed in, in content or, or mass? Uh, and for movement, you're talking uh, down to centimeters and sometimes millimeters in terms of the ability to measure change. So 
that is the power of the synthetic aperture radar doing a repeat orbit and then combining those two measurements every 12 days to see what has changed. So that's, that's why we fly at the lower altitude in the polar orbit versus the geosynchronous where you're looking at one space and that's where the weather satellites fly. They're always looking at, for example, the Western hemisphere or the, or whatever to say what's going on from a weather perspective, but we want to have much more precise measurements. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now I noticed that ISRO has two different launch vehicles. One is called the PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, and the other is the GSLV. Uh, so my thought would be that they would use the PSLV to launch something into polar orbit. So, you know, as IITians, we look for these, uh, you know, these, these uh, apparent paradoxes, and it seems that they are using the GSLV Mark II. Mark II, I guess, because it doesn't involve any prohibited technology. That part I understand, but but why are they using the geosynchronous uh, launch vehicle? Um, my understanding is it's just mass. Uh, the GSLV has more throw capacity, mm -hmm. and this is a big spacecraft. So, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can launch on any azimuth you want to, whether you're a PSLV or a GSLV coming okay. out of the launch site, but uh, it's really mass. Okay. So the GSLV think... has the capability to, to get this uh, very large spacecraft up into orbit. And very large and very heavy, I think, translates to what about two and a half tons, if I if I remember. Uh, right? I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty big machine. Okay. Well, our audience is uh, putting up a number of questions. I'm going to select some of them. First of all, when will we see NISAR in orbit? Uh, right now, early 2023. Uh, so. 2023. As you might imagine, uh, we originally had a launch date earlier in that, but the uh, COVID pandemic uh, really impacted all of us. Sure. We had to stop work at JPL. I know ISRO had to stop work uh, working on the uh, S-band system. Right. Uh, and so uh, we've recovered from that. I think we're still not as efficient as we would like to be sure. in terms of the work going forward, just because we can't have everyone that we would like to have working in the space we would like to have them working in given the COVID restrictions. but but right now, uh, I mean, if everything was perfect, it could be late 2022, but we're kind of saying early 2023. Got it, okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the specific benefits that will come to humanity from this? And let me just pick a couple of areas. Uh, you know, uh, here in Southern California, we are under severe threat of fires at this moment because of the Santa Ana winds and the very dry conditions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the work of NISAR will help uh, in that regard in terms of forest cover and fires and so on? Yeah, again, uh, you've got a radar, both L-band and S-band. And again, this is the first uh, swept SAR, L-band, S-band, dual band spacecraft. And I, I talked about biomass. So I would, I would equate that to understanding what's happening with the fires because with the L-band and S-band, we can look at biomass how, let's say foliage, how much the forest is compacted and full. And if you have a fire, that's obviously gonna be reduced. And so we can get a, a pretty rapid picture of the devastation caused by a fire, for example, because that biomass has changed. Suddenly instead of you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of trees, I may have lost 30% of them or 40%. And now I can get from space a very clear picture of the devastation caused by a fire. Uh, and then uh, that will help us to manage how we recover from that. I see, I see, great. So one area that I think is shared, uh, a shared concern for both the, the United States and particularly California and India is the impact of earthquakes. Uh, here in California, we live in a seismic active zone and much of India, particularly North India is subject to earthquakes as well. And there's been a tremendous amount of construction in the last 20 years, and India hasn't seen a seven point something earthquake, uh, you know, in a while. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, how NISAR will play a role in terms of uh, seismic activity and monitor monitoring that? Sure. Uh, as I said, kind of our tagline is earth in motion. Yeah. So obviously, uh, as you all know, we all sit on tectonic plates and the earth is constantly moving. And again, uh, with the interferometric measurements, you can measure down to very fine grain detail. So one of the things that NISAR will give us the ability to do is see 
the motion of the surface of the earth at very fine levels, centimeters, potentially millimeters. And that's helpful for the uh, geologist to understand what's going on with the movement of these plates. So for us, for example, in California, the San Andreas Fault, uh, how much is the earth moving? Certainly we have ground-based systems as well with GPS that are measuring that in certain areas. But if you want a global look, NISAR is going to allow us to do that. So I think that's point one in terms of just understanding what's happening. Do we see rapid movement that we didn't have before? Could that be an indicator? And again, earthquake, earthquake prediction is kind of black magic these days. You can't really do it very well, but at least understanding the precursors is an important thing. And then if there is an earthquake, uh, understanding how the earth did move, also being able to map uh, major areas of devastation based on the change that we measure with the L-band and S-band radar and interferometry. And that will aid uh, disaster response also. So both those I think are important to both uh, the US, California in particular and India as well. Got it, okay. Now the two different bands, L-band and S-band are being designed, you know, one, one in the US, one in India. So will they be controlled by their respective uh, organizations or will the US have access to India's uh, radar and vice versa? Yes, uh, India will be operating uh, the spacecraft and uh, the data coming down. Uh, they were primarily gonna downlink the S-band into the India area, of course, uh, and then uh, uh, the US will downlink the L-band for their purposes, but uh, there will be joint access to this data. And you know this is uh, a global good, really. And so certainly the S-band from an Indian perspective, they're gonna focus most of their measurements on the Indian subcontinent and some, a few other areas that they're interested in. The L-band will focus globally. We'll measure globally all these uh, changes. But so you really do have two pair of powerful uh, regimes that will be operating, but the data will absolutely be shared. And there's multiple, you know, India has a downlink site. We have downlink sites that are handling these, frankly, large quantities of data, you know, like 43 terabytes of data per day that we have. 43 terabytes per day. Wow. wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is, this is a, you know, you talk about big data and being able to manage that. This is a challenge. This is one of the challenges we've had to deal with in terms of just designing the onboard telemetry and downlink system and the ground system and the ability to handle all the data. Well, later on, we are going to talk to Bob Balaram, who's, uh, you know, sending something to, to Mars, and let, let's see how many terabytes of data he can get in a day from Mars. Uh, it's not terabytes <laughs> from Mars, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one of the questions that has come up, uh, and, and I want to preface that a little bit, I know many IITians who used to work at JPL, developed some great technology and then have gone out and uh, built their own companies in the areas of batteries. I know somebody has done that in the area of data and some GPS related work and you know, crypto and so on. So one of the questions is about uh, you know, the kind of startups that, you know, that might be spawned by the data that is gathered by, by NISAR. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a glimpse of, you know, what what could be possible? Yeah, I mean, um, again, this is uh, a unique data set with respect to global measurement of Earth change. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, I'm sure there's people thinking about it out there, but I think there's going to be a variety of, of opportunities to take this data and, um, you know, let's take biomass. I mean, if I can measure biomass very accurately and globally, I think there's value in that, uh, whether it's for uh, agricultural management, whether it's for farm management. Um, so, I mean, there's just a whole host of things I think that that data can be used for and that things that we haven't even thought of yet. But once the data is there and accessible, then it's developing the analytics and the tools to do something with it that, frankly, at the, turn, at the end of the day, you make money on. Got it, got it. Okay, now you used to work for the US Air Force for much of your career. And I know that there is tremendous military col collaboration that is happening between the US and India today. But from what I understand, this project here is a purely civilian project, right? There's no defense or military considerations to this at all, right? Right, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in the US, the, the Civil Space Agency, NASA is totally separate by law from you know, uh, Air Force space operations and DOD space operations right. and so on. So 
So we're totally separate now. I mean, obviously this is very useful data for a variety of purposes. So right. uh, there could be military utility in the data just to understand, again, if I'm looking at a particular area, I'd like to know as much about that area as I can from a military perspective, then this data can be useful, but this is a purely civilian program. All right, okay. Um, just looking at the audience questions to see if there's something we haven't covered yet. Uh, um, are there future programs planned uh, in terms of collaboration between ISRO and, and NASA that you can mention briefly? Um, I would just say that we're absolutely actively uh, working in that arena. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've met with Chairman Savan uh, many times, um, and I know our, uh, our Office of International Relations at NASA is continuing to have dialogue. There's ongoing dialogues that happen. I know uh, India, we're having dialogue now in terms of signing the Artemis Accord, which is the Accords about, you know, our mission to the moon, the manned mission to the moon. Uh, and, you know, for Earth science perspective, uh, as I said earlier, the decadal survey that we do in the U.S. defines kind of the next 10 years, the priorities that we should look at for Earth science. And one of those priorities is essentially a follow on to NISAR. It's taking that set of measurements and uh, trying to develop them further, improve, bring new technology and so on. So, I mean, there's no guarantee that that would end up being a partnership with sure. India, but, uh, you know, we need to look at those things and say, yes, there's absolutely opportunity out there and there's absolutely dialogue going on about what those could be. Got it. Okay. Uh, are there a number of IITians working at, uh, at JPL that you're aware of beyond Dalok? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say right now there's uh, between 10 and 20 that I'm aware of that have graduated from IIT and, and come to JPL. As you said, some have come and gone and done, done other things, uh, but just a very strong relationship. And you mentioned Caltech. Uh, you know, there's a great presentation that Caltech does about the relationship with the Caltech and India and IIT back to the 30s. Uh, where the, some of the professors were over in India doing uh, gamma ray experiments with balloons. And uh, so just a, a very historical, long-term uh, collaboration. And uh, we actually have an intern program with IIST where we bring two interns from IIST to Caltech every year to get their master's degree. Right. And then they do a summer internship at JPL. And so we're trying to build those relationships, build that knowledge of one another, and I envision that, frankly, in the future, there will be more uh, folks from IIT here at JPL. Got it. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, my day job is helping Americans to deal with India. And, uh, uh, you know, I, in fact, I used to teach a workshop at Caltech on doing business in India. So hearing, uh, hearing you talk about the challenges of the time zones and the cultures is, is very interesting to me personally. Um, if there are students listening to this uh, talk uh, and students from India in particular, uh, do you think uh, there may be room for somebody from there to think about a career at, at NASA or at JPL? Of course, of course. I mean, Alok is a great example, right? Uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years at, uh, at, uh, in India and Israel and then came to the US and started working at JPL. So, yeah. uh, we are a very diverse and uh, globally diverse organization at JPL. We have people from France, people from Australia, people from India, people from Great Britain, uh, people from Germany that, that work at JPL. So uh, it's just, you know, what are the skill sets you have? What are the needs that we have? And frankly, are you uh, in the top tier of those? You know, we have about 6,000 folks that work here and it's a very competitive environment to come. But uh, I will tell you that the, uh, the Indian students that come from IIST to Caltech, I think last year, two years ago, the master's degree student was the top student there. So uh, you're doing very well. Great, great. So uh, let me ask one final question. Uh, as I alluded earlier, you know, what is your favorite space movie? Uh, you know, I would probably have to, uh, probably not too exciting, but, you know, I'd go back to the first Star Wars movie. I mean, this was, uh, I was, uh, you know, it came out, I was at the Air Force Academy. Uh, it was very inspiring. I loved space. And it just kind of gave you this excitement about space that uh, 
with the visuals that had never been done uh, that, that uh, you know, no one had done before. And it was certainly at a very form formative time of my life. So yeah, I go back to the first Star Wars movie. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. I did watch that movie. I was, it came to India back in those days. It took three years for a movie to show up in India. And I was working in Bangalore at that time. I just graduated from IIT Kanpur and I got to see Star Wars, the very first one. Yeah, so I have good memories of it. 